Hi there, good evening, and welcome to Tech Circus's UX strategy event this evening. I hope you've all had a great day. It's super, super toasty in London, so thank you all for joining, as I appreciate. You might rather be out and about in the sunshine. However, we've got a really great agenda this evening and really excited to welcome our guests tonight. So we could not host our events without our sponsors. And I'd like to say a big thank you to the sponsors we have this evening. We have Vinted, who's relatively a new sponsor of ours. So big thanks to Vinted. Uh, they are the largest online C2C marketplace in Europe. <laughs> and they're dedicated to secondhand fashion and a growing community of over 45 million users, which is pretty mega. Um, we also have um, in the chat rooms a chat for them. So if you've got any questions, um, you can pop them in there if you're just a bit more interested about the company and a bit more um, potentially uh, just some opportunities with them. Um, we also have Sherpa, um, he's another one of our uh, sponsors this evening, that UX design studio founded in Istanbul. Um, they're currently operating in London also though, and they're creating a unique user and customer experience. So we can get up their pop-up too. Um, if you want to find out a bit more about them, please click on the link here and they'll be happy to give any more information to you. So that's a couple more for you there. Another sponsor we have, last but not least, is Zebra People. They're really loyal to us and a big thank you to them for, for everything that they've brought to us. Um, it's a really great relationship we have. So um, if you're listening, thank you, Zebra People. So Zebra People specialize in digital recruitment and they bring together the smartest digital talent with the best love brands um, and also leading agencies and startups too. So they have a real range of clients there. Um, we also have a networking room for them. And if you'd like to know a bit more, then I can just put up a pop-up for that too. Um, in terms of recruitment as well there's always opportunities it might be the time lockdowns ending you might be looking for um, sort of a new opportunity a new a new challenge so do reach out to them either with the pop-up below um, or within the chat too and last but not least uh, this is a conference that I'm organizing in September this is stemmed from conversations we've had internally and with designers that there is a real gap between business and design. And we're trying to bridge that gap with this conference by focusing on the maturity of the designer. So what skills, what business acumen do you need as a designer in order to get a seat at the table? Very niche, brand new conference, ticks every box. Um, do, do reach out to me, Izzy, if you'd like to know uh, more about the conference. We've got the initial agenda, there's initial website uh, a few months away now, but we're very much starting to wrap things up in the next couple of weeks. So we are still open to submissions. So if you uh, would like to speak or you know someone that would, uh, please let us know. We're always uh, keen to know a bit more um, about our community and what they can bring. And there's a pop up here as well, which is where you can find a bit more information about that. So that'll be a three day event, building up from senior practitioner to heads of and managers, concluding with C-suite on the final day. And then we also got a day packed with really interactive workshops as well. So super hands-on, educational as always with us, and just really engaging content. Um, great start to the autumn. So do you get stuck in. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker onto the stage. Uh, Dimitri. Dimitri, if you'd like to turn on your camera and your mic, please, that would be great. Hiya. Hello, Izzy. Hi, you okay? Thanks for having me. Uh, oh, really cool pleasure. stuff that you're bringing on next I uh, know, next right? We're, we're, we're busy bees here, aren't we? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's, that's really super, Dimitri, and pleasure to have you. Whereabouts are you today? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, that's all right. Whereabouts are you based today? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> no worries. So you, I think you're screen sharing tonight, aren't you? So I'll just stay with yeah. you whilst that's loading up. Awesome. All right. Well, best of luck, Dimitri. Enjoy, and I'll catch you in a bit. Yep. Thank you very Cheers. much. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm Dimitris Nyavis. Uh, I've been doing UX for about 10 years now. I've worked with uh, startups, SMEs, and now in uh, a multinational. I'm a lead UX designer at uh, Anixe, which is part of the FTI group. We work in uh, the travel industry, and I would like to share a story with you today. Uh, we did with a team dedicated to one of the most profitable companies of FTI Group. Um, so we were uh, two scrum teams dedicated to build the new back office system of a company. 
which means that uh, our stakeholders were the heads of the departments and our users for these systems were the company employees. We began with uh, some work with the POs uh, to assess the situation with uh, this company. And we found out some context that we didn't have access to users whenever we wanted, uh, whenever we needed actually, uh, which was a big pain for us. Uh, the, the, the process were a bit of a patchwork, uh, hot fix upon hot fix, which made uh, really complex uh, systems and how they, they, they needed to be operating. Uh, there was siloed knowledge uh, within the departments, so we really need to dig deep in order for us to find information, but they did not share between them. Not because uh, they didn't want to, but they didn't uh, use to, to work like that. And the way that they used to work with, with software companies was to actually present a requirements document slash feature wish list and say, here, grab this. This is what we need. We know it. Go build it which creates uh, most of the times a uh, really wasteful uh, software and, and it's really, really bad. So we, so that was a really low UX maturity with the company and we needed to address this uh, as soon as possible. And we started our, uh, our strategy with a bottle of rum. We got together with, a, with the product owners of the team and we started thinking how we can actually get stakeholders to work with us and have access to the users and create something actually useful because uh, software useful tools for them because life is too short to, to work with a crappy software and uh, we had a chance to visit the headquarters in uh, dubai and speak with c-level executives and the heads of the departments and we started to address that we have a common goal and we want to engage with you so we can learn from you and you from us so we can both create something useful right so we started with a business which is their domain and they know it better than anybody else then we explained that we need to build some technology and this is on our domain on the team and then we have designed to create something that is both has utility and uh, usability so and, and it's important to work with all three because if we only get uh, design and uh, business but it's not feasible technologically then we're creating something the fantasy if we don't have design nobody wants this thing uh, we're creating waste uh, and if we don't it's not business uh, it doesn't make sense for to be it's not in line with the business then we're just having a hobby so it, it's really important that we all work together we learn from them and we need to ask some stupid questions to understand to gain uh, knowledge from them and then hit the sweet spot in the middle so initially our goal is to focus on the desired outcomes and not the output it's not the feature or uh, what they have in mind but it's what, what what is the goal of the business what are the kpis that we need to be addressing or moving uh, the second thing that we did was to remove the black box of how software is created. Like we needed to create transparency with them. So we started to explain uh, what are our processes and why we did what we did, why we work, why uh, as we as we are. So explain that we do research and we will need time from them, and then move on to analysis, design, and then test again with them to make sure that this is what they need. Then we're gonna start developing. And then we're going to release the software and keep uh, observing if it's uh, what they need and how we can fix it. Again, we explained that we work in an agile way, which meant nothing for them, but <laughs> we told them that it's a two week sprint. So, and then at the end, we release some usable code, some updates, some improvements for the system. In these weeks, we told them that we will need time from them to either ask questions or to test prototypes and uh, do usability test and whatever it's needed on each specific uh, part of the process. Uh, at that point, it was really important for us to communicate the complexity of what's out there, uh, what's out there, I mean, the processes of the company and the whole systems that they're using. So we did an abstract kind of abstract map of the departments of the company the systems that they're using are suppliers and our clients. 
and we need it to we need them to understand that if they ask us to do a small change at some point we need to make sure that the system won't break so they know they need to know that there is this complexity these are the processes that they work with right now and we need to also fix this because if you digitize a, a crappy process you're going to end up with a crappy digital process and we need to be addressing these uh, these scenarios then we addressed and we set some expectations about software development initially everybody believes that for a three month project we start at one point and it's a straight line to to the goal and everything is perfect but the reality is for the same uh, three months project you might not understand everything correctly from the beginning and if you deliver something uh, three months uh, at the end you might be off target and since at all these three months you will have gained some knowledge or something new had happened in the ecosystem let's say COVID, for example and you will end up creating something that's far ahead from where you should be uh the the ideal scenario right to solve the problem so what we will propose is for the same scenario the the way that we work uh let's say that we start with uh not the perfect understanding from the beginning but after a one sprint two weeks we have we will have done uh, user testing so if we see that we are off course then we can course correct and keep on uh, creating uh ideal not ideal but better solutions for them and at the, at the let's say that the scenario with something unexpected or we gain new knowledge after we work together we see that we should be building something different then we can course uh, correct again and move on to create something even more useful for them adapt to the situation what they need this doesn't mean that they can change uh, what they what they want but it's something that we can uh, we can adapt to and the 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 way that we try to not convince them but uh, let them know about the value of uh, of ux research was to stop talking uh, uxes like they don't understand wh what we are saying we needed to find a common language something something that they could understand so we tried a, a simple roi example of uh, let's say we need to speak with users four times four hours per week for the three months project this will require us to speak 52 hours for the three months and if the the salary of uh, that specific employee is a thousand per month then the initial uh, investment would be three three hundred dollars and let's say that we after with this research we can make a slight uh, task efficiency improvement of let's say 30 seconds per task, which was something completely doable. And we actually did something like that for a task that's been used uh, 20 times per day. Sorry for the math, but uh, eventually we will be saving 10, uh, 10 and a half hours for the, these three months. And actually this will save us uh, $61, right? So we invest 300 and it save us $61. But this specific task is being done by all 60 employees of one department, which will end up saving us for these three months uh, $3,660. So we have uh, an investment of uh, the time and we get back an ROI for a slight improvement uh, that is 24 times what we put in. And uh, the result so far of uh, this process is that we created a transformation within a transformation. And as John Pagoni says, every UX project is actually a transformation project. Uh, research uh, has been an integral part of the process on when we create a new, new module for the system, for the back office system. And we, we do continuous research by observing it and speaking with uh, with users. Uh, we have access to, to people when we need to have access, uh, either for interviews and when we observe some uh, unusual behavior, then we can go and talk with them. We can do user testing uh, almost as much as we like. And this is a big, uh, big win for us. We have managed to gather uh, funding and uh, time to create a research repo 
so we can start collecting all, all the research that we're doing and share it with the people that they need to have access with this repository. And we have managed to push back on uh, one of these requirements of Doom that we were asked to build 23 screens uh, as a glorified Excel sheet that they needed, the thought that they needed. And after research, we found out a way to give them more value, more information uh, with just three screens and make the life easier because they don't have to navigate. And we simplified the whole process with that. That was a big uh, that was a big win for us, and if you could remember something uh, from this presentation, I'd like you to remember to engage your stakeholders. Don't try to manage them. You're on the same team. You have the same goals. Uh, work together with them, and it will work uh, wonders with you. Uh, for you, remove the black box. Be transparent with them. Uh, they don't know your work, you know your work, and you need to be uh, educating them to an extent so they can understand why you're asking the things that you're asking. Set and manage expectations, which is one of the biggest uh, life skills that you can have. If they expect to have something in one month and it will actually take six time, uh, six months or it would say three months and then you could find some problems and it will take more, let them know, manage their expectation, expectations. Speak their language or speak a common language. Don't uh, use buzzwords uh, to communicate with them. Nobody understands you and uh, it's, it's pointless. Point to set goals and uh, key performance indicators, which is really important to don't compare uh, your opinions uh, while you make some decisions. Like point to something that you have mutually agreed. It's it's a way to go. And last but not least, uh, always remember that data and insights will be more than than opinions. And this goes with the previous slide um, to to use the data that you have gathered from your research to back up your opinions and then create a culture that will stop thinking like that. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dimitri. Um, really, really great talk there and loving the kind of takeaways at the end as well. Um, really actionable there, which is what we like. Hope you enjoyed speaking as well. <laughs> yeah, and I got the time right. You did, you were spot on. I was the one that talked too much in the introduction. I was going on about everything we're doing. So you've got a couple more minutes. You can maybe, we can maybe ask a couple of questions actually whilst I've got you here. Um, Cause quite a few have come through just while we're talking. If you're happy to do that, use up a couple more minutes for your slot yeah, as well. Yeah. I'll let you yeah, have a drink, it's hot, yeah. Um, so we've got a few questions that come through. Um, one of the highest voted ones is from Satyrus. Um, excuse my pronunciation there. It's sometimes a little tricky with names. Um, how did you manage to fit user research within a sprint? And what was the frequency of conducting the research? Oof, that's a meaty one. Uh, how did we manage to do it? We just did it. We planned it <laughs> and we just executed. And in, I mean, it depends on which stage of uh, the process we are, right? Uh, we managed to have some time ahead to do some uh, generative research so that we'll make sure that we're building something that they actually need mm -hmm. uh, so that then we had even more time but while the developers were uh, actually building we have set a date uh, and we said that okay we have let's say time box some time for a specific department employees that we can ask and then we can go and use the test or observe them I hope fantastic yeah, uh, no, that, that's that's question. lovely. That's all right. Um, we just got some nice comments as well uh, coming through. Um, Eddie Rich, hi Eddie, thanks for the question. Has just asked, um, what did you use for the research repo? Repo? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Say that. <laughs> uh, we used the uh, dovetail. Did some research on uh, on the tools available. They were pretty much. Uh, I think the top two three are pretty much the same, but I, we tested. We tested them and Dovetail uh, was working better for us. Wonderful. Is, well, thanks. Thank, 
Oh, you're a star. Thanks so much, Dimitri. We're looking forward to answering um, more questions uh, towards the end of the Ooh. event when we have the panel. Super. Um, so I'd now like to welcome um, our next speakers to the stage. Uh, I'll just bring them up. Thank you. <laughs> so I have Yuri and Melanie now coming to the stage. So Yuri and Melanie, if you'd like to turn on your cameras and your mics for me, please, that would be super. Hiya, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, Hiya. Great. Hi, Michael and Cameron. Yeah, we're good, thanks. How, how are you both? Excellent. Good, good. So I'll just get your presentation up for you. Thanks again for joining this evening, guys. Yeah, so uh, great. Hi, everyone. Um, this is the second slide now, not the title slide. Is that correct? Doesn't matter. Um, I'll introduce myself and uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, this, this looks beautiful, that's why I wanted to show it. Um, <laughs> our talk of today, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, super fun to be here and meet so many people from uh, all over the world, actually, which is super cool. Uh, it's a bit of a downside to not meet in person, but it's an upside to then hang out with so many of you all over the world. So that's super, super nice. Um, today, Melanie and I are going to talk about something that's been on our mind for quite some time. Um, we call it present uh, forward. It's a bit of a conceptual framework that we're developing uh, that we'd like to sense check uh, with you basically. So don't expect, uh, how do you say that? A, a, a fully flesh, fleshed out concept, but I think this is going to be triggering a lot of discussion and hopefully put some things in place, connect some dots for many of you. Um, so, Melanie, if, you, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, super excited that we could uh, talk with you a little bit tonight. My name is Melanie Gorka. I'm a strategic design director at AKQA Amsterdam. Originally Canadian, have been living over here in the Netherlands for a few years. Um, Yuri, do you want to take it away? Take it away. Yeah, my name is Yuri. <laughs> I'm uh, from the Netherlands. Um, we're both professional for quite some time. Uh, and in my case, I graduated as a visual designer, uh, gradually pivoted to becoming a UX designer. Then now I call myself a strategic designer. So, and I'm, I'm, I don't think this is new for anyone or different for a lot of people. Um, but in my career path, you see that we, uh, both Melanie and myself actually have gradually changed our roles, um, but throughout our career we kept on calling ourselves ux design and we believed that we were doing ux design but ux design has changed um, we both work at akqa um, i'm gonna quickly talk a bit about akqa not to talk about akqa but to put some things in context uh, so akqa is an agency that works for clients um, we apply science and art together um, we So our, our projects are generally very beautiful, but also very uh, based on data, on science, on rationale. Um, the type of work that we do varies a lot. We do design work, we create campaigns, we do big tech pieces, we do commerce, uh, physical products, physical spaces, brand identity. And throughout all these types of projects, UX design in one way or another is always involved. Um, and I'm, I hope you start to realize that as a UX designer, you need to be extremely versatile and flexible to be able to adapt to these types of projects. Um, we create future brand experience, we call it. We, do, we always apply a brand experience or business lens to that. And again, this is not to show you what we do, but to show you how we as designers need to wear all these different hats. Um, and we do that for many clients, uh, many sizes, many industries, uh, complex, small, anything. Um, and what we realize when a lot of clients come to us, um, we call it today's paradox, is many clients ask for something that makes them future-proof, that makes them resilient for what's about to come. They all realize that they're under pressure, there's a lot of competition, there is a lot of disruption happening in, in all industries, especially because of digital. Um, so they want us to help them prepare for the future, yet make impact today. And what we think this, let's say, uh, brief to us uh, allows uh, or, or results in is, is a bit of a 
is a bit of neither. So they want us to think visionary, and at the same time, they want us to launch products uh, in agile fashion, rapidly, incremental uh, optimizations. And in, in the way I describe it, you can already imagine that for us, these two conceptual ways of working are two separate things. So, um, oh, where is my slide? Yeah. So they ask for both. Um, we like to work on both, right? We're both visionary, uh, or we get excited by visionary work. Um, it's it's, but at the same time, we also want to make impact. That's why we're in this business. We we want to create products and 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 content for end consumers. Um, and it's important to do both. Uh, if you need to run a, a a good business, you need to be able to understand what's about to come and deliver impact based on what is happening at the moment. So, but what what often happens if we're asked these questions um, is that we do neither of both. Uh, delivering impact takes too long because we want to think big and think long term and make proper strategies. Um, and at the same time, if we do that, then it's too short-sighted. So the strategic thinking that we like to do uh, because the client is also asking us to deliver impact is too short-sighted and therefore the strategy isn't that good, right? So neither product or strategy uh, is good. So what we propose today is a perspective that hopefully <laughs> delivers both Awesome. So I think um, hopefully you understand and your reson this resonates a little bit with you. And I think a point that Yuri made in the beginning when he was introducing us is that our careers have been evolving just like the discipline of UX has been evolving. And we think in a way this is the perfect moment to start looking at this, especially as UX becomes more mature across organizations and companies are really grappling with that dichotomy between yeah needing impact now and also wanting to look in the future. Um, so we have a great quote here, which is to build strategy, you need to start with the future. And we're calling this new evolution present forward and future back. And to go into a little bit around what that is, you know, the, the impact side, or if you want to go to the next slide, Yuri. Um, I or I can do that, can't I? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot that. Uh, by the way, if uh, anyone clicks on this within the presenters, we can mess with each, other, with, with each other's slides. That was a good thing to learn beforehand. Um, anyway, sorry, back to the um, idea of um, the future and the present. So we really think that where the strategy side of UX is going is really helping companies to figure out where to leapfrog, where to take a look at new business ventures in the future. But that really is not the kind of main bulk of the work that is needed now, because to get to the future, you still need to make sure that you're innovating, that you're matching customers' expectations from now until some months ahead. So this is why we're really looking at the kind of 2080 split of future and present in our work. So we, we've come up with this idea of splitting the two different parts of um, design within the organization, especially strategic design or what we used to call UX, into team impact and team vision. And the idea of this is really that the one half of the organization focuses on helping clients improve today's business and the other half works on future proofing tomorrow's businesses or creating resilience. That doesn't necessarily mean that for a client we don't do both of those things or that they're completely disconnected. However, the types of um, activities, and we'll get to that a little bit later, and the types of people needed or mindsets needed are different because it's really difficult to focus on the near term and also in the long term. Otherwise, you end up with nothing, just as Yuri said. So what that looks like is product design on the left and strategic design on the right. And I'm sure everyone is hearing, you know, this new term of product design, which is a mix of UI UX. Um, really, it's it's not just about the actual core deliverables of UI UX together. It's also a mindset. It's a mindset of expectation, uh, sorry, experimentation. It's a mindset of being able to really take a look at the product, um, different parts of it, take a look at a journey, research, create hypotheses. Uh, really focusing on optimizing that product. And, you know, we've really started to this, the whole reason we started to evolve the question of what role does UX have in the future 
was because we started to realize that a lot of our clients needed a mix of UI and UX, especially as we rely more on design systems and the idea of UX is becoming a bit commoditized. Strategic design is a really interesting way of kind of decoupling strategy um, and UX from needing to always be doing hands-on deliverables or prototypes. Not to say that we don't prototype concepts or create experience um, visions or storytelling. We do those things. However, it really is about taking big strategic questions or systemic questions and, and taking a look at them from an applied way of, of mixing that science, as Yuri said, and applying a design lens to it. So on the left, again, on that impact side, team impact, we launch products. We're currently, we're constantly optimizing current experiences, looking for new opportunities in the near future, taking learnings and insights from, from the business, from different POs or from different parts of the, of the structure of the clients we're working with, and really focusing on creating a robust roadmap that can take um, developers through perhaps from today to six weeks, to six months, to 18 months. On the right side, uh, we're really building and we're creating bets. So, at, you know, I think when we talk about future facing initiatives or when we're trying to think of where our business is going to go, you can't validate that in the same way you can uh, validate a feature set in a product. With a feature set in a product, you can get enough users to validate. You can launch live experiments. You can use data to really say, OK, this is exactly the result we're going to get. However, when you're looking at new value propositions or perhaps new directions a business should explore to meet the needs of consumers that we haven't really even defined yet, you can't use the same kind of um, you know, metric to be able to really say, okay, this is it. At best, we can really make a sort of educated guess and you know, use science behind it to say which areas the business should go into based on you know, a set of um, deliverables where we can research or you know, business strategy we can take a look at. But really, these things are going to take a business maybe not even 18 months into the future, but generally three to five years or five years and plus. And these are thought starters that the organization can have to gain investment um, or to gain the right skills or capabilities that need to exist for a company to go in these directions. So, you know, when we look at organizations that we work with, I think these are other ways for you to kind of maybe think of it. Um, we have tried to split what is the agile kind of run, which is backlogs and sprints, that idea of product design. And then on the right side, we have the more double diamond process. We're using service design and business design, and that is what incorporates for us the discipline of strategic design. What that looks like in practice is that we have um, everything that's being done on product design comes from Epic. So we look at the product, the functionality, and what we're creating as a deliverable for the strategic design is a roadmap at the ecosystem level and a set of initiatives that could perhaps become epics if they're tied together between agile, sorry, between the product and um, strategic design. But you can also do it separately for the client. Um, perhaps they're not ready to do a whole product organization with a constant run stream and different product teams working on different parts of the journey or the business. But perhaps they just need a roadmap in order to set up and get investment for future initiatives. We always look at more of a broad ecosystem look, whereas the product can be looking at really sort of vertical um, slices of, of, the, of the business that we're looking at. And I'll hand it over to Yuri to go a little bit more into what does the product side or team impact look like? Yeah. Um, so the, the reason for us to split this is not only from a let's say our own for our own peace of mind <laughs> to make sure that we do either one uh, of those let's say uh, tasks really well but it's also helping us to find good people uh, and to make sure that these people know what they're uh, tasked to do right so um, as you can imagine, the typical skills needed uh, on team impact, which is, uh, like Melanie said, supposed to uh, work on, on quick, iterative, uh, let, let's say, products. Um, you, you need product managers, you need product designers, you need UX researchers, you need people who can create content, copywriters, uh, photographers. Um, editors, uh, you need analysts to analyze whether or not uh, your your uh, A/B test is successful or not. Um, you need development, obviously, to launch these products. Uh, 
So this team is made up of a multidisciplinary uh, skill set that is uh, ready to launch products in uh, the quickest way possible. And in our case, we are an agency that worked with clients. So there is some alignment generally necessary between, for example, the product owner or uh, if our client has their own development house uh, or a development team in-house, uh, we'll work with them. But the team is supposed to be able to deliver end-to-end, uh, -end, let's say, uh, uh, incremental updates to any digital product. So the typical activities um you yeah you, you can guess this is product design right um discover identify pilot scale this goes relatively quickly right so we're looking at one month and obviously the scale phase takes um yeah in, in indefinite <laughs> i would say um discover is where you understand the gaps and define where to play to win so the strategic phase is, re is really short. And as a strategic designer, I struggle with that. But that is the goal of this team, right? To be able to deliver something really quickly, make decisions and not and be okay if that decision isn't necessarily the right decision. It's, it's exactly uh, to Dimitri's point. As long as you do it really quickly and you learn and you, you, you have the flexibility to uh, pivot, then it's okay to fail because you, you, you'll pivot um, and, and you need to be honest and transparent about that towards your clients as well. Uh, the identify phase is where you prioritize uh, desirable, feasible and vi uh, viable items. So this is really uh, a, a collaborative exercise with uh, either your clients who uh, brings in perspective from the business and your designers who bring perspective from customers uh, and your tech team who brings a perspective from, uh, let's say, a feasibility point of view. Um, pilot, uh, where you launch the product uh, and scale, this is, like I said, an ongoing process where you work together um, to understand what's happening, to launch experiments, to hypothesize, to use data to inform your next increment. So this is a really data-driven um, piece of work that we're uh, running together with our clients to, to make sure that it is possible to launch uh, really quickly. So this is... I wouldn't say this is not new, but for us as an agency, it is really helping us to uh, focus, right? And for us as designers, it is also really helping us to focus because we now know that if I am in team impact, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm, I shouldn't be worrying about long-term vision. Uh, that, that is team vision uh, as a responsibility. And like Melanie was saying, if that team uh, is, is, let's say, split up from, from this team, but still working in the same space, for example, or uh, finding ways to collaborate, then the, the best of both worlds uh, will happen. Yeah, and I think um, just to that point that Yuri was making around, you know, also giving focus to the different teams or to really help, um, you know, I think we were feeling a lot of pressure in doing the strategic deliverables in a very short amount of time and also realizing that those aren't always the right things to do. However, there are problems that really need deep research and, you know, thinking that goes really, you know, down different types of paths in order to research and validate and continue to refine it until you get at the, you know, the heart of, of the right direction. And so giving that space back to design strategists, researchers, and the people in this discipline has also really given a lot more of a feeling of, okay, yes, this is what I signed on to do. I don't know if any other companies are feeling this pressure, but there was a point where UX and product are very similar, but UX didn't really feel as if they were doing the work they were brought in to do. Um, product sometimes felt that they were doing you know, too much of, of the structural work. So we've really been able to take the best of the both sides, but to give them that difference to focus on, yeah, what the gaps were. Um, so in the team vision side, what we typically need is people who have strategic thinking abilities, um, who are able to do different types of modeling, whether that's business modeling, whether that's data modeling, research, different types of research capabilities. So this could be anything from qualitative to Quantitative analysis and research um, could be, you know, maybe hands-on research, 
concepting. So we still do hands-on design here, but it's a different kind of design where we're not giving fully fleshed out features or screens. We may still have UI, but it's more of a concept uh, UI. So we're showing enough elements for people to see it come to life, um, to create those artifacts, but it's not the fully fledged idea and it'll change drastically if it goes further in refinement. Workshop skills, design and moderation, really funny ways to co-create with clients, especially in this era of um, virtual working. It, you know, We can do even more close co-creation with our clients. A really big and strong skill here is, is managing stakeholders. In a way, any of the findings that come out of this become a pitch into the business. And you need to be able to talk to people from all over an organization to be able to really um, yeah, gain insight. So being able to work with any kind of stakeholder imaginable is super important here. Um, and then prototyping. I think when we look at the different types of deliverables, having someone who's doing prototyping of that concept, perhaps prototyping new and emerging technologies, that is also super important. And though we haven't, we're thinking through to add these skill sets of prototyping, video creation, we need a different way of telling stories than simply user flows, customer journeys, uh, that kind of thing. And this has been a big learning and something that I think Yuri and I really connect on is we want to always take our deliverables, break them down and reinvent them. Um, we don't want to do the same deliverables all the time. And we realized that actually perhaps we need to rethink journeys and think more about what is the story that's being told through videos or animations. Um, and then what are some of the activities that happen in Team Vision? So again, we kind of have a similar start, so discover and identify, but then we move into concept and create. In the discover, we want to understand how businesses can leapfrog the competition or perhaps pivot towards the future. So the tools that we use or the activities that we do here are primary research. We use things called CX impact surveys or context mapping and among others. A lot of stakeholder interviews, a lot of time just understanding the client's current state or their aspirations. We do a lot of secondary research here to kind of um, match the different insights from inside and um, primary research, whether that be market trends, competitor benchmarking. We also do audits depending on the type of project. Maybe we're looking at a transformation project, so we need to look into their tech stack to understand if it has um, enough adaptability or resilience for the future. We look at the ecosystem, SEO, all of those things. Maybe we'll do some light customer journey mapping, but it's a very high level. We do a lot of opportunity mapping, uh, value streams and prioritization. Um, and here we're really looking at OKRs and, and a different kind of success metric. In the identify phase, we're looking to start prioritizing those spaces because then we want to dive in and start validating and testing whether or not these are the right bets for the company to look um, to leapfrog. So here we do value proposition uh, definition and workshopping. We create hypotheses, we do business model definition, and we start to do some conceptual ideation and prototyping. And then we continue into the concepting phase where we really want to articulate the business bets in a way that is tangible for people. And this is a huge challenge, right? Because you don't want to give away too much detail, but you still, all sorts of stakeholders need a different level of fidelity. So this is where our creative team really supports us in being able to show the articulation of the concept in some visual way or to show the story. Um, we do a lot of co-creation and prioritization again to be able to figure out which ones we wanna validate. And then in the create phase, this is where we validate those business models and define a robust and value focused roadmap. And perhaps it connects to a product um, roadmap stream where it can actually go into um, a maturation phase and go from initiatives or portfolio level initiatives into, um, into epics. So yeah, so this is our, you know, the landscape of the, the work that we're focusing on um, of defining this uh, present and uh, future initiative. I'll hand it over yeah. to you, Rui. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a I think we have seven minutes, so we'll we'll flick through this. But um, this probably makes a little bit more sense if we talk through some cases. Um, as said, this is a reorganization that we've gone through uh, within our agency. It's a con concept that we'd like to uh, build out, but um, it's based on the work that we've done on uh, many many of our clients actually, and one of those clients is Toyota, which is uh, the European um, Toyota Motor Europe. So they they are, let's say, managing around 36 markets and every market has 
their own digital products with their own content and their own users and their own needs. Um, and Toyota Motor Europe uh, creates, let's say, a template for all these markets uh, to work from. So that is an incredible uh, digital, let's say, project. It's really complex. Many, uh, first of all, the automotive industry is really complex, but the fact that this is like managing 36 websites is also really complex. Um, and they came to us with one brief, which was reimagine our website. Um, so as a designer, the first thing you do is like, woohoo, that's, that's an amazing brief. Let's do it. Uh, and we came with beautiful concepts and very visionary work. And slowly over the course of weeks, months, they started to realize, wait, we need to launch something quickly. And we were still in a mindset of delivering a beautiful vision. And they were in the mindset of where's my product? Uh, why am I not seeing anything live? And that is, we, our, our response is, yeah, but that's not what you briefed us to do. Um, but it is the reality of a business. So, you know, we, we had to adapt. Um, and instead of trying to like model or uh, simplify our vision, which would, would have been a bit of a pity, we said, okay, let's split the two streams like we're proposing here and uh, launch a portfolio team and a series of product teams. And all of these product teams are responsible for a specific facet of the digital experiences, not necessarily only the website anymore, but also their apps, uh, their, their POS, uh, point of sales, uh, digital touch points. Um, and the portfolio layer is responsible for managing all of those product uh, streams, as well as coming up with big initiatives uh, and doing research on where's what what will the world look like uh, what will electric vehicles uh, look like in the future how will um, uh, hydrogen cars have an impact on a business right these are big questions that a company like theirs are uh, struggling with that that portfolio portfolio layer helps to figure out and Occasionally, a piece of work comes out of that portfolio layer that goes into these product layers and 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 uh, and becomes a, a digital product um, that that customers can uh, can enjoy. Um, let me skip through this. So here's a you know quick quick overview of the types of work that we do. It's it's very tactical. It's very tangible. It's you know we create a design system. We create prototypes. We create uh, yeah, apps, websites. So we're not talking very lofty stuff here, but at the same time, we do need to clarify the difference between creating a design system on one side and a vision on the other side. Let me skip through this. Yeah, so we also wanted to kind of showcase the other side. So um, we're going to talk through an example from within our network that was worked on. Um, if anyone's joining us from uh, North America, then you are probably very familiar with the Mayo Clinic. Um, so this really was this idea of transforming and creating a North Star vision for Mayo. And I'll talk um, how many we have about three minutes, right? Um, so I'll go through this really quickly. So this was creating a North Star vision of how could Mayo exist in an increasingly digital world and how can also um, Mayo continue to deliver care in the way that it currently is because it's a world renowned care. So the different parts of this was to focus on that North Star to create it, to create a digital strategy to support it, but also to create these kind of high level briefs around how can we actually take that vision and how can we um, you know, build out the different aspects? And I think when we're working on these big future facing briefs, we can't just look at the experience. That is much too fine grained of a result, but we need to take a look at what is the digital vision? What is the product strategy? What is actually the operational design? Because you need different capabilities to meet this. And in this case, you know, really wanting to focus on AI, what is the particular technical expertise that needs to exist or you know, needs to adapt within an organization to actually make the impact. So the Mayo Clinic team, um, they ended up, you know, having one vision, but that led to analyzing, you know, everything that's happening, taking a look at 187 projects, fielding that into seven programs of work and leading to one MVP to get started. So just to give you a kind of 
really high level introduction into just the scope of with which we're taking a look at the organizations with the strategic design side. We really want to create that North Star. We want the organization to be able to achieve it. But to get there, we don't want to waste what exists or only start from scratch with a tiny MVP. We also need to understand how eventually that will ladder back up. And this is why we call it future back. So we create a future, but then we work with our clients backwards in order to be able to help them get there. Um, and I think I won't go too much into the details of what was created, but you know, just a bit of a view over all of the different ways that we wanted to create the future for the technical side, for patient access, to have a design system that prepares for the future and also eventually an MVP to help with different um, digital touch points. And yeah, so that is our, our model for um, future back, sorry, present uh, forward and future back thinking. So to just end off, you know, we really think and believe that to be able to, to land strategy that feels like it's been really impactful and really create a lot of value, that we, we need to continue to split these two things and to evolve them as separate disciplines and then eventually also, you know, make those intersection points really strong for our clients. Um, do you want to also pick up the, the last few? Yeah, I can, I, I, yeah, I, I can uh, talk about this. So like Melanie said, the, the, the split needs to be clear, but uh, I think one of, uh, I think I saw a question or a Q and A of someone who, who was asking, okay, cool. The split is, is clean, but actually how do you bring it together? Um, so we totally acknowledge that it's necessary to uh, bring it together, right? So to run a successful business today and tomorrow, the two, the two must work together in harmony. Um, and the, the only way that we see it works at the moment is through a strategic roadmap. So every every company has a strategic roadmap. The program that Melanie was talking about of 178, uh, or the, sorry, the program of seven initiatives, that is what we're talking about. There needs to be alignment within the business between agency and organization about that strategic roadmap. And that strategic roadmap is being uh, influenced by team vision um, through future uh, thinking. Uh, it, it feeds the roadmap with strategic initiatives, but the strategic roadmap becomes the backlog uh, for, the, for team impact. And obviously team impact will inform the strategic roadmap as well, because they are closest to the actual customer. They learn, they see what's happening, they, they uh, run their experiments. So that roadmap becomes a collection of let's say optimization as well as uh, future initiatives that help the company uh, get to where they want to be, uh, be in the future. So with that, uh, I think we're, we're closing off our talk. I hope this was useful, um, interesting. I hope it connects uh, some dots for uh, a few of you who've been going through this, let's say soul searching process of, am I a product designer? Am I a strategic designer? You're both but not at the same time <laughs> that's what we're uh, that's what we're hoping to uh yeah we'd love uh, feedback you know part of why we wanted to talk about this is we're still you know evolving it we feel like we've found some really good um growth in this in both sides but we'd love to hear people's um ideas or challenges even um on this so so thank you thanks everyone Hi guys, thank you so much for the presentation. You can tell you put a lot of time into that as well. It was really beautifully presented. Um, just because of a bit short on time, we'll have to hold far on questions until uh, the panel discussion, but we've had lots of questions coming through. Um, so we'll have time for those um, at the end. And thank you to the audience for being so interactive tonight. It's already it's always really nice when we get lots of questions through and get lots of discussions going. Uh, but a big thank you to Yuri and Melanie for their super presentation. Um, I'd now like to welcome Tugba to the stage uh, for their presentation as well. Tugba, if you'd like to turn on your camera and your mic, please. Hi. Hi, how, how are you doing? doing? Hi, yeah, you're right. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Lovely to have you. Whereabouts are you based? Uh, I'm uh, at uh, Izmir. Uh, okay. at the Aggie and C cost. So, oh, um, okay. So what, what sort of time yeah. is it for you then? 
It's 9 p.m. right now. Oh, quite late. I was about to say it looks quite a bit darker there. It's, um, it's yeah. been a strange day in London. We've gone from sort of 30 degrees and sunny to now oh. solid rain. Very British. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It was very, yeah. very, very sunny uh, and hot today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, really? You've had the heat wave as well? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining. I'll just get your presentation up for us. Okay. No worries. And uh, over to you, um, enjoy and catch you soon. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Izzy. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tuba. I currently work in Sharpa um, as a UX strategist. Um, Sharpa is a digital design studio um, which provides consultancy for various brands from e commerce to fintech companies. Um, I started on my ca career uh, in academia. Uh, focusing on digital uh, societies and move, then move, uh, moved into UX uh, while pursuing my dissertation. I also have a background in strategic planning, um, thereby I developed uh, a multidisciplinary uh, approach in design, I can say. Um, currently in Sherpa, um, I work closely with teams in five different projects, um, translating insights into experience strategies by organizing uh, workshops, um, leading inquiry of uh, opportun opportunities in terms of societal, cultural, uh, and institutional reflections of um, on visual design and guiding the design process from ideation to conceptualization and its visual implementation. And today I'm going to uh, open up the idea of team play uh, constituting the core uh, principle of UX strategy, uh, open up a little bit, uh, a little, little discussion about it. So I will present my inspiration behind this approach by asking or applying um, the question of why team play? And then um, I will just uh, share my brainstorming notes about what UX strategy is not and what it's all about. Uh, and finally, I will point out uh, the levels of team play, uh, such as with users, with other teams and with stakeholders. So in, uh, 2020, a uh, COVID-19 virus outbreak uh, has been declared as a pandemic and shortly after, because of the uh, precautions, we all had to stay at our homes, uh, still have to stay at our homes. Like most of you, I presume, in my free stay home times, um, I've also become a fan of streaming um, platforms, maybe uh, addicted to because there were times that no other options uh, were at hand. Uh, and mainly it was in uh, on Netflix. And in May 2020, a 10 episode docuseries called The Last Dance was released. For some, it was the best TV show of the year. For others, it was worst documentary of the year. But for me, on the other hand, it wasn't just a new documentary about successful years of Chicago Bulls, or it also wasn't an autobiography of Michael Jordan. The message I got was this, a strategy um, focusing mainly on team play can propel a team to greatness. So the success did not only come from uh, the star of the team, Michael Jordan. In fact, designing a game plan with him was a challenge in itself for the coach, Phil Jackson. But the persistent success, uh, the championships actually, came from the strategy, which was a result of an incorporation of team play. So um, as Jamie Dewey states uh, in her book, book, UX strategy is not a, a fixed goal or just the North Star to guide your UX strategy. Instead, you want a goal or point towards which to steer every time you pivot. So uh, a fixed goal followed by certain design decisions to achieve that. So for me, UX strategy is not a fixed goal or it's 
uh, even not a competition with other products or services, which in the end boils down to replicating the feature features that competitors uh, offers or tactics, a full set of tactics, a tool to meet business needs. Uh, from my experience in the context of design thinking and user experience design, uh, UX strategy is uh, something that might get mixed up with tactics. So because tactics may change according to the context of the limita limitations of the development phase, time plan, or other resources, they focus on spe specific uh, steps you'll take in accomplishing the tasks or achieving short-term goals. So uh, it's neither uh, a reactive action plan, which uh, all, to all those bullet points above, such as needs coming up to down from business or immediate fixes for responding to the schedule of the development team. So how would we then define UX strategy? I will state a defi definition of it later on, but let me give some uh, bullet points what it stands for. Strategy is uh, as I said before, uh, rather a game plan. So in which shifts focus on user experience, um, outcomes in an, an environment consisting of users, competitors, and business goals. So which states a cha change uh, we wanna see in the world. Being the game changer uh, is an outcome of a strategy. So which also can be achieved with a shared understanding uh, of the outcome or the vision in business terms. Um, and which should be decided and implemented uh, in a collaboration with other functionalities, metaphorically uh, at the table we're sharing with every product manager, engineer, marketing manager, sales manager, etc. So team play, uh, it's all about team play at the end. So team play in design decisions are made, uh, hands are shaken off on what goals you want to achieve and to what end, what people should take into account and what challenges or opportunities to take into account. So everyone should be on the same page about uh, what you're doing and why, so you can get them on your side and get their, their support. Uh, for me, this game changer uh, is IKEA. Uh, like, again, Jamie Lewis states, uh, and I believe and witness that's true, a stellar user experience strategy is a means to achieving disruption in the marketplace through mental model innovation. So IKEA is a game changer and innovator, disrupting our mental models on how we style our homes, what we what we expect from buying furniture, which is sometimes to install these units or ourselves um, or to have multifunctional uh, items. IKEA changed our perspective um, and persists to change our perspectives by opening up the first second hand uh, IKEA store in Sweden and launching a trash collection in uh, 2021, which actually means repolishing of IKEA items received from trash, uh, as you all can see, sustainability as the uh, guideline or the value it emphasizes. So it has, uh, as I emphasized an outcome is a change we want to see in the world being the game, cha game changer uh, has such effects the Catlon, uh, is a french sporting goods retailer with thousands of stores in various countries so um it follows this change since ikea has already twisted our approach to shopping experience the Catlon in turkey uh, followed the lead in secondhand sporting goods uh, retail. This is a landing page uh, of an app of Decathlon in Turkey called Second Chance, uh, which provides uh, a platform for buyers and sellers to sell and buy secondhand sports equipment. So this is a good example of how an outcome is related to strategy and how it is translated into actions and creating outputs. 
But um, shifting an organization to become more design driven is a long game and you can't do it uh, by yourself. Um, it doesn't um, happen to be or implemented by itself. Uh, remember at the beginning where I refused that um, your strategy to be reactive. So uh, what your strategy is about a game plan, uh, a team play with users to fulfill their specific needs to finding the right problems to uh, pinpoint and to create the right solutions to them. And also it's uh, a team play with other functional teams, creating touch points while making decisions with uh, others. Uh, and also it's, um, it's a team play with other stakeholders to get their support and the promotion of UX is made. Let me open up these ideas with uh, some details. Uh, team play with users means that um, to find, to understand at the first hand, the current experience. So this is the essential part uh, in the foundation of UX strategy. The uh, users, um, we have to know what users really think, what re users really want, and um, we should not be making assumptions about it and therefore we have to learn to emphasize uh, empathize to deliver right solutions to right problems that comes from the uh, ux research uh, to uncover um, those problems and create actionable uh, insights to, to to translate them to into actionable insights so uh, we shouldn't be we shouldn't hesitate to involve user feedback even in the implement implementation process to have a backlog and when needed to turn uh, to that backlog and um, understand where where we are headed with the right metrics that we uh, measure our strategy. So Airbnb is uh, one of the uh, great uh, examples, as I see, to emphasize this um, team play with users uh, idea, uh, because uh, with COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, it, it was the main uh, product that's been affected uh, from, from the global uh, lockdown. Uh, so they 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 uh, maintain their UX research and they understood how to turn their uh, experiences uh, into digital experiences that people can share their uh, unique uh, local um, experiences uh, with 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 online on online and also there's. The other example that microcopy and uh, voice and tone uh, is also a part of your strategy. So if we're uh, choosing not to uh, advise or not to lead our users, uh, instead of saying, I can offer you three options, inviting them to uh, the table and let's look at some options together, seeing that is inviting them to the table. Team play with teams uh, means that it has uh, two levels, actually. Uh, the first one is in our team. Uh, we have, if we have different um, professions uh, in our team, that's the first level. And the second level is other teams, other functional teams. So. Uh, creating touch, touch points while making decision is means that if we're deciding on UX strategy and its uh, reflections uh, on other products or services, we have to be clear about what we, we want to achieve and what we're expecting from other teammates or other functional teams. By expecting that, we have to also give them ownership. So we should be uh, prepared to hand off 
our UX strategy to other functional teams too. So not just UX folks to guard uh, the, UX, the UX strategy or if uh, we're on the right course to measure that, but other teams should own our UX strategy too. So uh, in order to do, do that, we have to collaborate uh, while detecting which problems to tell, uh, solve, which to prioritize. So it's just not, uh, yeah, it comes from your strategy. We know that uh, which problems are severe than the others, but other um, options can be on the table too, like um, the schedule of the development team or other business goals we want to achieve in the first quarter or in a year. So we have to prioritize um, together with uh, other, um, other, other teams on the table. But uh, in order uh, to do that, we, we empathize about challenges of other teams, like I said before. The development team may uh, be just one uh, development team uh, for different uh, product uh, teams uh, or uh, again other departments may have uh, different uh, challenges so we have to uh, show empathy to them uh, too so um, for a jared spool uh, strategic ux outcomes are the changes uh, we want to see in the organization. So um, we have to be proactive about UX strategies, which require uh, that we work across the organization while working at the team level. So um, Jim Kalbach also uh, describes this kind of teamwork uh, resembles with uh, jazz improvisation, so which employs similar principles uh to design focusing mainly on empathy within a team um uh, again back to our uh focus um on being the game changer in terms of teamwork the star is uh spotify uh, suggesting a new approach to agile uh by uh kinberg and iverson have created created an interesting organizational structure for uh, Spotify, as all uh, you all may have known, um, all employees belong to each groups, four types of groups, uh, consist consisting of guilds, chapters, tribes, and uh, in within tribes, squads. Uh, it has reflections not just on the team side, but uh, on the uh, methodologies that emerge from this kind of teamwork is the Encore uh, Foundation, which is the uh, design system of uh, Spotify. So Encore Web is um, a resource for all uh, web-based uh, platforms uh, of Spotify, uh, which includes everything from patterns to guidelines. So the, uh, the systems are connected like the teams are connected. So it's it's a result of uh, this kind of teamwork we can see. Uh, and, and at the end, um, the last point is uh, team play with stakeholders. So uh, to have uh, the support of other uh, departments or stakeholders, um, making them advocates of UX is not just uh, teaching them the language of UX, but we can't just expect all state stakeholders to learn UX, to understand the language that we use. Um, instead, we can make them trust us and uh, make them our allies. Uh, so team play with stakeholders means to growing empathy with them like we do with our users. So um, we, we have to also create a growth mindset, mindset and participate in solving business problems with them. And being actively involved uh, is critical here. 
um, maybe making the room, organizing the room to co collaborate and boost learning uh, with workshops uh, and other sessions uh, will provide us the room we want for, our, for ourselves as UX uh, designers. Uh, that means sometimes we as designers be being the translators of um, user pain points uh, and our user findings uh, into the language of business. So uh, we uh, invite them into the conversation, but need, not in our terms. And the community by uh, treating them as partners, uh, we can turn them into advocates of UX. Uh, it's also important to expose them to user insights by relating to business goals of different uh, departments, uh, different uh, goals. Uh, user uh, exposure hours, uh, they're called. Uh, Joseph Paul proposed that uh, the idea that uh, a bare minimum of two hour dose of user uh, exposure uh, in in a month or two months period is is very uh, very uh, good for every employee. So uh, form uh, we also have to form a shared understanding of the com outcome to own the strategy and uh, make room for participation in defining the process of the uh, outcome. All stakeholders want and need not to know everything about design, but the higher level, uh, their level of design knowledge, the better uh, they'll be able to uh, speak the same language with us. So we don't have to teach them, but we can uh, guide them. We can make them learn. We can make them participate with us. At this point, uh, Laura Martini's uh, quote is very influential and where she pinpoints the value of UX research. But for me, it's relevant for UX strategy too. Designers uh, have to have maybe empathy for their users, but often forget to apply the same approach to the design that uh, to decision makers in their companies. So to sum up, I said at some point of the presentation that I will define UX strategy uh, as I believe um, what that is. Um, so, Team play as uh, the core principle of UX strategy, uh, which means that displaying empathy in order to uncover the right needs of the users of the product or service at hand and to e effectively collaborate with various teams and to have advocates of UX while creating uh, user your user experience strategy aiming for a game changer outcome. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much Yuval, for that presentation. Um, really relevant as well around the areas of empathy and design too. That seems to be a conversation that's coming up a lot with the discovery calls I'm having for our conference later in the year. Um, oh, I have yeah. to know that. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it's sort of one of those things that's just sort of like a very super relevant topic at the moment. Um, but yeah, beautifully presented. We've had a couple of comments come through. Um, people can hear the crickets in your garden in the background. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> no, not at all. I think it's everyone envious of the of the warm and the sunshine. So <laughs> um, we've also had lots of questions come through and a lot of interest around your talk too. But I think what we'll probably have to do is just, just in regards to time is hold fire on those. I'm sorry about that. So I'd love to ask you some questions, um, but hold fire from okay. those and then have those in the panel discussion at the end, um, which Helen is kindly okay. hosting. But thank you again for your presentation. I hope you enjoyed it as well some really interesting case studies too so looking forward to learning more about those a bit later on this evening as well happy to know that thank you very much Easy. oh our pleasure pleasure to host you um so i'd now like to welcome uh brad to the stage uh for his presentation hi brad if you'd like to turn your camera and your mic that would be great thank you Hey, we've got you. How are you doing? 
Oh, can't hear you quite yet. Might be worth a, maybe a refresh of the browser. <laughs> Uh, not quite yet. Maybe, um, yeah, refresh and come back in. <laughs> so whilst Brad's coming back in, I'll just use this opportunity to talk a bit about the events we have coming up. So next week we have our NFT conference. If you weren't here at the beginning of the evening, um, do get stuck in on the website and find out a bit more about this. Uh, a couple of days finding all about the future of NFTs. We've got some world industry experts there. Awesome. Hey, Brad, you're back. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. How are you doing? Great. Glad. Sorry, I not sure what happened there. I'm just no, no worries at all. And apologies, we've run on a bit. I think sort of bits and pieces have got in the way. We've had a few discussions here and there. So I'll just get your presentation up and let you crack on. Um, bear with me. Awesome. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Excited to talk about using behavioral science to increase product adoption here. Uh, just a very quick summary since we're tight on time here. Uh, I used to be an academic. I got a little bit tired of publishing journals uh, and then having those journals sort of sit there and wallow in uh, unused space. And so I saw a lot of uh, opportunity for bringing behavioral science out of the lab and into the real world and making a difference. So I left academia, uh, joined Danny Ariely at the Common Sense Lab uh, for a little while, did some uh, research on how to bring uh, behavioral science out of the lab into fintech uh, when the funding in uh, that sort of hybrid lab dried up. I joined Next Step, where I am now currently the uh, chief behavioral economist uh, applying behavioral science in all kinds of cool tech companies uh, across the world and uh, particularly in the Bay Area, which is where I'm located, which is why it is moderately sunny and nice here uh, and not uh, dinner time, I think, where everyone else is. All right, so let's uh, let's continue on to get to the, the real content here. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is get everybody on the same page and make sure that everybody listening uh, is familiar with at least the broad ideas of behavioral science and what we're all about. Um, and we're gonna talk about why it's relevant, particularly for startups, but uh, and lots of uh, various size com companies as well. Um, then I'm gonna talk about how behavioral science sort of slots in with uh, UX uh, and UI design, as well as sort of qualitative stuff and, and using it uh, in a mixed methods approach from marketing all the way through the funnel into uh, customer retention and, and as far as you wanna go into the, the user experience. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a quick break if we have time uh, because of some good behavioral science learnings from a, a previous mentor of mine that, uh, basically suggest that anyone talking for more than 15 minutes uh, is talking to themselves and you should have some time to process and ask questions uh, between monologues. And so I'll try to do that if we have enough time. If not, I'll, I, I will uh, ignore that stage advice and plow on through into the real world examples of using behavioral science to improve people's uh, sort of top of the funnel uh, work as well as deep in the uh, product uh, UX UI as well. Okay, let's talk about behavioral science uh, or behavioral economics. I may use those words interchangeably. They are basically interchangeable. Um, a lot of them are sort of substitutes for uh, applied social science as well, depending on what school of, of uh, academia you came from as well. But for our purposes, uh, uh, behavioral science will will be the umbrella term here. Um, and uh, okay, so what is behavioral science? Behavioral science is the study of how pe uh, humans really make decisions. We put that little really in there um, because there is another big field of human decision making that has a seat at just about every policy and corporate table that is out there, which is economics. Uh, and economics has sort of come to dominate social sciences as the as the as the seat at the table. Um, and economics is great, and economists are great, and econometrics are great for uh, very specific types of problems. Uh, the problem that economics has is that it was uh, developed under conditions of ass the assumption that people are, are rational. Um, and if you have interacted with the human race for more than five minutes, you can start to see why that assumption is somewhat comical. Um, but what's interesting about that is that it is sort of the backdrop and the, the baseline for when we ask folks to make decisions, we sort of assume 
that they come at it from a rational perspective. And what I mean by rationality here is pretty specifically that more information and more choices is a good thing. Um, and behavioral science tells us that actually the opposite of that is very often true. Uh, if you like your Bay Area tech -y lingo, the 80-20 rule sort of applies here. So um, most people are walking around with the idea that 80% of our uh, decision making is based on some sort of rational process with you know, the sort of remainder 20% being emotional or environmental or social factors. And as behavioral economists, we th sort of think the opposite of that is true. So 80% of a decision is emotional, social, contextual, environmental. And then you're sort of using your rational brain to post hoc rationalize that decision that was sort of made in the using those other um, factors. Um, to illustrate this a little bit for folks uh, at home, um, we'll use health as, a, as an example here. So right from, from the traditional model of, of rational decision making, um, everyone should be healthy because it's very clear and most people know what makes us healthy, right? The nuances are, are not always perfect, but uh, most people know that you need to eat your fruits and vegetables, exercise, drink water, get enough sleep, right? That's that's the sort of core of it. Uh, you can you can fine tune around the edges, but if you're if you're doing those things, you're in pretty good shape. Um, the problem with that is that knowledge doesn't always translate into behavior. And I don't think I need to search very far to find folks. In fact, uh, it might just have to search this room to find people who maybe uh, stayed up too late watching Netflix. Uh, skip their healthy breakfast, skip their morning run, and grab a cup of coffee and signed on to a webinar to give a presentation this morning. Um, so I know what it means to be healthy and I know how to be healthy, but translating the environment over into being that, uh, that is, is a whole different sort of can of worms. Uh, a fun example of behavioral science in action um, here is uh, a, a group that came out of the uh, lab that I used to work at that built an alarm clock for uh, for trying to keep people uh, accountable to their morning exercise and uh, healthy breakfast goals. Uh, the alarm clock would go off like in a normal alarm clock and you had the option to press snooze. Uh, and in version one of the alarm clock, what happened every time you sent snooze was you sent a donation to uh, a political campaign that you liked uh, so that you'd be financially uh, punished every time you pressed snooze. What happened was that people didn't feel any guilt uh, sending money to politicians that they liked. What uh, really changed the game for this uh, alarm clock product was when we factored in loss aversion, which is a very famous behavioral science principle. Basically, people feel losses uh, about two and a half times more than they feel gains. Finding a hundred bucks on the street feels one good. Losing a hundred dollars out of your pocket feels two and a half times bad. Um, so they factored in loss aversion. And every time you hit the alarm clock, now a, a donation was made to a politician that you don't like. And that was very effective at people uh, getting people out of bed and onto the street to go, to go running. Um, so uh, some nice sort of applications of like, Everybody has knowledge and choices that they can make, but you need to have the environment and the social factors and, and the contextual factors ironed out so that you understand what it is that actually gets people to do the thing that you want them to do. Behavioral science is all about trying to document these things. And we've got lots and lots of principles. Uh, if you go on Wikipedia, there's like a giant list of 300 places where people deviate from rationality. Um, but uh, it, we're going to talk about a few of them today that are sort of uh, very replicable and um, uh, super relevant. Um, and one final point there is to, to note that it's important that people are um, systematically irrational, right? Because if people are randomly irrational and they're just sort of all over the place and their decisions are, are um, not rational but in a random fashion, um, that randomness makes it very hard to predict and use the fact that people are irrational. If they predict and uh, if they deviate from rationality in their in systematic ways that we can use over and over again and, and document, then we can uh, look at those ways that they deviate and systematically uh, think about the context where that is happening and, and tweak that environment to try to help them make a better decision. We call those systematic deviations heuristics and biases, which you've probably heard of if you've heard of behavioral science. So we'll talk about a couple heuristics and biases that we can leverage to uh, improve product design. So as we are thinking 
thinking about our, our uh, customers and our, our users, we should be thinking a little bit less like they are uh, Spock and a little bit more like they are Homer. Um, and I think that I should really drive this point home for our, our B2B folks uh, or anyone who's designing any kind of um, marketing or interface or any kind of product for uh, B2B clients uh, more than B2C, though it is absolutely applicable in both cases. Um, B2B tends to assume that their users are a little more sophisticated than, and, the, and particularly their people that they're marketing to are a little more sophisticated than the average person. And in some ways you're right, right? You're talking, if you're telling, if you're uh, selling a complicated software to a, uh, a savvy person who knows how to use a similar software or is very technical in nature, they know some very specific things that make them really great at their job. However, um, that doesn't mean that they want to be communicated to in a very sophisticated and, and technical way. Um, even uh, and, and sort of B2B companies tend to assume that that's OK because they have these smart people that they're selling to. Um, but in reality, uh, paring it down, making it easy, uh, using some of these heuristics and biases to communicate with them is still much preferred and much easier for those folks. So a little more like Homer, a little less like Spock. Um, okay, why is this applicable to anyone on this call and particularly anyone sort of working in startup to large company space? Um, uh, we've had some other folks talk about the fact that uh, the, there are these really great uh, tech companies starting to adopt all of these good research practices, uh, including uh, all kinds of qualitative and quantitative and AI and great methodologies that are starting to learn. And behavioral science is increasingly uh, a, a, a unit in all of these big companies that is really, really important. Um, I'll also note that as companies start to grow and get out of the startup phase and into product market fit, um, behavioral science and, and this kind of research becomes really important for sustained growth and sustained insights, right? So when you're done throwing at spaghetti at the wall uh, and seeing what sticks and you've got a, a product and you need to start scaling in a way that is a little bit less just throwing spaghetti at the wall and a little bit more insightful, um, behavioral science really has the tools in terms of how to create um, syst systematic uh, learning processes and insights that stick over the long term. Because behavioral science is one of the few causal methods, so we run experiments, which means that we understand the why behind people make decision as opposed to observing the what. Um, we really have durable insights that can be ported from one part of the product to another. So if you only have the bandwidth or the numbers to run experiments in your marketing, but you know that there's a research-backed theory, and then you have an A-B test that shows this is actually what motivates people, you can use the fact that you have good theory and you have results that are portable and are causal, right? If you have a control and a, and a theory-backed principle in your experimental condition that bumps up the conversion, you know that that principle, if it's loss aversion, is gonna be portable to other parts of your product because you know that that loss aversion is the motivation behind why that ad worked. So it's more, much more usable than a classic sort of madman approach where you just throw a cool ad up there or you uh, just try something in the user flow and say, this might work, you know, let's try green instead of blue. Um, we have a much stronger understanding of why the idea is working as opposed to um, just that it does work. Um, on top of that, we have a, a really nice methodology um, that if you are familiar with any kind of mixed methods approach will seem familiar. Um, our methodology looks very much uh, like a four-step process with behavioral science inserted into every step, no matter whether it is a, uh, an assessment or our qualitative research or our quantitative research, we're using behavioral science to de-bias each one of these steps and figure out where we can use behavioral science to improve the product uh, or the experience at any at any point. So in our assessment, we're using uh, our knowledge of a lot of uh, social proof and expert bias to parse apart the idea that you should just go talk to one group of people or another. We try to consume the product uh, before anyone tells us about it, before the C-suite, before we have a meeting with the C-suite or before we uh, look at the data, we'll try to look at it like a consumer and try to document all the places that we think behavioral science would have a big impact before being biased by any kind of groupthink or expert bias or uh, social proof. Then we step back inside the bubble, look at the data, talk to the C-suite and combine those two things to try to create some 
uh, insights to say where are the places that we can uh, produce uh, real results and there are real opportunities, get some buy-in. Then we do our qualitative research. Um, we go, try to go broad. We try to knock down our ideas, not build them up, right? Because uh, that's confirmation bias. Some more use of behavioral science principles to improve our process here. If you're trying to confirm an idea that you had, you are going on looking for ideas that prop you up, which will put you at maybe at a local maximum as opposed to the, the actual maximum. Uh, instead, it's better to try to knock your ideas down so that uh, uh, if they still stand up by the end of the process, then you know that something is actually enduring here uh, instead of just sort of gathering a, as much evidence as you can for your, your pet idea. Once we have those insights uh, and maybe some new ones have popped up, we wanna try to validate them uh, at scale. Uh, so we wanna try to run an A-B test or something more sophisticated than just an A-B test to try to make sure that our insights that we gather in our previous two steps actually have some sort of impact in the world. It's all very nice to come, come to the table with theories and great design and talking to lots of people, uh, but we wanna actually show that they work uh, and so we want to run a test. Often what happens is that we have to run these tests in marketing uh, because they have the, the, f the funnel and the numbers and the statistical significance to be able to um, actually validate our ideas. But because of what I talked about earlier, because this is causal, because we have a theory, because we can demonstrate the lift, we know that there's a good chance that some of these ideas will port over into the UI, into the UX, into the product, into the sales funnel, and further down the funnel. Um, so once we have those lifts, uh, we can then get our creative team to execute on all of those good ideas uh, because they are well steeped in behavioral science as well. And as I said, we can pull them into, uh, you know, we can deliver those insights to our UX people, to our um, designers, to our copywriters, so that they can deploy them across a bunch of different areas for the clients. Okay, so. Um, this is just a, a nice illustration of this idea. We've had some great results all throughout the user flow. Many of these are things that we d uh, did work on at the top of the funnel and then pulled the insights into the user journey to show that we could also increase those um, places along, along the UI, along the customer uh, experience throughout the entire product. All right, I think I am uh, just within my time to be able to do this. Okay, I had a great mentor at uh, Columbia University named Daphne Shahani who studied uh, how people learn and how people make decisions. And one of her uh, great insights that she uh, held us to at every class that she had was that um, if someone is uh, monologuing or uh, teaching, as we may say in other contexts, um, for more than 15 or 20 minutes, uh, people start to zone out. People are not processing really what you're saying anymore unless you are an amazing public speaker and very engaging and very entertaining. I'm not going to stroke my ego to that level. So I'm going to give you two minutes to actually type out the questions that you have, um, process some of the information that you had. I'm just not going to talk for like a minute and a half so that you can actually like reflect and recoup because you've been having people talk to you for uh, like two hours at this point. So I'm going to go quiet and you guys can ask questions and then I will come back and we can keep going with uh, examples of, of all the stuff that I've been talking about. Hi, Brad. I think you've frozen uh, potentially. Oh, no, you're back. <laughs> nope, I'm good. I'm just giving people time to ask questions uh, in order to sort of process the information and then we'll keep going. Okay, all right, no worries. I know we're a little pressed for time. Normally, I would do like three to five minutes to do this actually so that people can chat and have dialogue back and forth. Um, but since we're a little pressed for time, I'm condensing to a minute. So I'll give people a few more seconds. Looks like there's a couple questions rolling in. So we're having some impact uh, with, with our strategy here, which is nice. Sweet. All right. Feeling good about a couple questions rolling in. All right. In the interest of time, we'll keep rolling. Thank you for asking questions. We'll address those if I have time at the end and uh, for sure in the 
uh, talking part at the end of this uh, bit. Okay, let's talk about some real life applications of all the stuff that I've been talking about, so you can get a good idea of what it looks to use uh, looks like to use behavioral science in the real world, in uh, marketing, in the UX, in the in the product, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this first one is going to come from uh, a B 2 C tech company in the real estate space. Um, this is a company called Really, and Really is a, a tech startup that we've been working with for a very long time at this point. Um, but they uh, started as a company that uh, basically uh, was able to uh, offer the real estate services using technology uh, that and, uh, and a, that allowed them to really cut down on the number of agents that they needed to, to have. And they made it so that the agents were working on salary instead of commission in the United States. That's huge, uh, particularly in the Bay Area where I am and they are based. Um, if you buy a million dollar home, the average uh, realtor commission is about 6%, so $60,000 on that. Uh, to cut it from, uh, and the, the two agents split that in half, they get three each. To cut it from uh, 3% to 1% may result in $20,000 uh, of saving on the average Bay Area house. Uh, and that's what they were leading with in their marketing uh, going into our engagement with them. And as they started to expand out of the Bay Area, they said, this is too narrow a value proposition. We need to grow. We need uh, to expand beyond our sort of MVP and be appealing to people outside uh, of, of this space that aren't as tech savvy. So how can we reframe the way that we talk about really both in our marketing and then pull that into the funnel and say, uh, get people excited to continue on with this uh, process as they download the app and so as they um, engage with the home buying process and things like that. So um, there's a pretty common problem for us. Uh, tech companies will come to us with a sort of MVP and say, we need to grow, we need to expand. We can't just be competitive. We, we've got our, our sort of product market fit, but now we need to reframe what we do in a broader sense uh, in order to make this compelling to people. So we went through our process that I outlined earlier. We interviewed, uh, at that time, we interviewed some uh, sales folks and some uh, real estate agents to talk about what it is that people really like about really as a product. Um, and what became quick, uh, sort of noticeable was that uh, this $20,000, as soon as you got out of the Bay Area, diminished significantly, right? If you go to Fresno in Central California, a $200,000 house is not the same as a million dollar house, four grand, not as appealing as 20 grand. Um, so how can we reframe all of this to be more tangible and useful to people throughout the rest of the experience and be appealing to users in new areas and quickly came to the... Um, conclusion that framing was really important here. Now, framing has leaked out of 40 years of behavioral science research uh, into the sort of conventional nomenclature here. But uh, framing, it, specifically in behavioral science uh, terminology, is taking the same piece of information and inverting it in some way that um, makes it more or less appealing, right? So 40% uh, fat-free, 80% fat-free ice cream um, sounds much more appealing than 20% fat ice cream, we wanted to see if we could do the same thing for when we were talking about really um, in, in different contexts. Um, and we talked to these agents that were selling and very quickly came to the conclusion that they were reframing this money as hedonic benefits. So what we mean by hedonic benefits is cool things you can go out and buy with 20 grand. Uh, so going on fancy vacations, um, buying nice cars, remodeling your kitchen, we ran some nice ads to test these ideas. So instead of saying 20 grand, if we said, take your family on a nice vacation with your savings from your house, uh, would that be a nice way to sort of communicate this value uh, throughout the funnel? And uh, what we very quickly found is that the buy a car and um, go on vacation ideas totally flopped. Um, and so that qualitative research was interesting from uh, that perspective, but they really didn't stand up when we scaled it up uh, to thousands and thousands of users. Um, but the thing that did resonate was this remodeling your home. Um, and so uh, we took that insight, we went and we talked to a few more actual home buyers and said, they told us, yeah, this is appealing because it's relevant to me. I don't really want to go I'm thinking about how to save a lot of money when I'm buying a home. I'm not thinking about how to then drop 20 grand on a car as well, or 10 grand on a car as well. So 
do things that are relevant to me. So we, we ended up with a, a relevant hedonic reframe where we came up with some more ads around uh, paying off your mortgage early, remodeling different parts of your house, um, you know, improving the, the landscaping or the putting in a pool to be with your grand, grandkids. That messaging and imagery worked a lot better uh, than our just our pure hedonic reframe or that 2% savings messaging or the $20,000 messaging. We were able to radically reduce cost per installs uh, as well as cost per download and then really started to take this stuff and say, okay, now we've got an app that talks about all of this savings in terms of percentages and dollar amounts and it's very much like minus this from the cost. How can we tell these stories in this way that is a, a sort of relevant hedonic reframe and make the app a lot better because of time i'm not going to go super deep into how that was done but now their product experience is uh, a, a lot more compelling uh, and we really reduced the dropout at different uh, points because we've able been able to do this uh, hedonic reframe it's now a core part of the way that they communicate their product from the beginning of the life cycle all the way into this uh, you know into the app and into the sales process all right let's do a b2b tech one real quick quick um, so that we don't leave those folks out. Uh, this is uh, increasing adoption with uh, for a company that is an innovation consultancy. So this is if your company is sort of stagnating and, and slowing down, uh, needs to be juiced back up into being creative and excited, you bring in a, a company called Vectorform that we did a lot of work with uh, in order to to uh, revamp their uh, the way that they communicate and the way that their uh, process uh, happens as well. So uh, we did our science and design process. We talked to a bunch of people who were making these decisions within the uh, executive space at this at this point. So this is high up uh, people who are approving bringing in this innovation consulting folks um, and. What we very very quickly noticed was that everyone was talking to us in what we would consider to be loss gain, uh, a sort of a loss frame, right? How do we prevent ourselves from falling behind? How do we not m miss out on opportunities? What happens if our competition uh, starts to innovate above and beyond what we can do? And they were speaking in this very gain frame. How can we get ahead of the competition? How can we innovate? How can we change? How can we, you know, do, do new and exciting things because they're an innovation consultancy, right? So that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so there was a mismatch between the language that folks were using. There was a, the gain versus losses. And we know that this loss frame is very motivating. As I said earlier in the talk, about two and a half times more motivating than the regular, uh, than, than a gain frame. Um, Losses and gains fit really nicely within this other psychological framework that we uh, called regulatory focus theory. Regulatory focus theory is basically the idea that organizations and people are walking around uh, in a, a state of mind that is one of these two things, promotion or prevention. Um, prevention folks are at zero, trying to make sure that they don't fall below zero, down to minus one. How can I prevent a negative thing? What does a product protect me from? How do I not miss out on uh, important information in this webinar? Um, Promotion frames is zero going to one. How can I achieve more? What does this product enable me to do? And how can I maximize my learnings from the webinar? If you can imagine a, a loss frame vert fits fairly nicely into folks that are prevention focused, a gain frame uh, fits nicely into folks and organizations that are promotion focused. Our qualitative process showed us very much that uh, these folks are prevention uh, oriented and uh, speak in terms of losses a lot. Uh, and so we needed to revamp what we, um, how we message the product. They also know, uh, were very conscious of the fact that they were, Vectorform is a smaller, more agile, sort of nimble uh, company, and they're being compared to Deloitte uh, and McKinsey and big consulting firms. Um, and no one gets fired for bringing in McKinsey or Deloitte. Uh, people can get fired for bringing in a, a small sort of niche uh, consulting firm. So they really need to differentiate themselves. And uh, to do this, we propose the idea of relative choices. So uh, people are really bad at making choices if they don't have a reference point to compare to, right? So if you are just saying, uh, think about our product, think about our product, think about our product, and you're not super familiar with what the product even does. Um, if you don't have something to contrast your mental model with, um, 
it can be very hard to sort of understand what the values are. Uh, Mac did, uh, and Apple did this great with their Mac versus PC like 15 years ago. I'm dating myself with this reference, but I do think it's a great example of it where they sort of stood up a straw man PC and then knocked down a bunch of arguments because PCs were very familiar to people. Macs were not familiar to people and they were able to differentiate themselves really nicely by sort of uh, contrasting folks with this. So we, we want to take these two ideas, build them into the, again, we, the volume was at the top of the funnel here. Um, so we needed uh, to do our tests in, in social media uh, in order to pull them down into the rest of the um, into the rest of the product. Um, so we ran four experiments, uh, sort of classic version of their ad uh, down here on the right, a relative a relativity piece where we sort of said big consulting just gives you a deck. Vector form is here for the whole process. Uh, and then we did our loss versus gain frame, which you can see at the top. Uh, and it's for the sake of brevity, our loss frame. Uh, was crushing it uh, compared to the control, almost 100 times, uh, almost double, almost 100 times better. Uh, our relativity did pretty well uh, as well. And our game frame, interestingly, did uh, better than our control as well, suggesting that there are game frame folks out there. Um, but And th that messaging works better than a sort of generic uh, talking about the benefits, but or talking about the, the features, but not talking about the benefits. Um, so we can use that uh, to, depending on the audience as well. So we, we put these two together. We started to build this into the uh, into the landing page, into the sales deck, into the product, uh, into the software that they uh, bring to the table uh, when they're uh, working with their clients. These frames were really helpful in motivating people to use the product, but then understanding what their needs and pain points were when they were going through the process of doing this sort of innovation revamp as well. So this, again, is a good example of taking something that had the numbers and the validation at the top, using a principle that was research backed and understanding the causal nature of it and pulling it down through the rest of the experience. One more very quick uh, application uh, in in the UI and some, some actual user testing here as well. So uh, this is an example from a company called Even. Even is a earned wage access, EWA platform that allows you to get your money that you earned before your payday. You can pull money out of your paycheck before it comes. Uh, this is great as an alternative to payday loans, which are predatory and very, very expensive. Uh, it also is your employer is technically giving you a loan when they don't pay you for a month. Uh, uh, even if you get paid monthly or, or bi-weekly or weekly, you're getting a you're, you're, you're giving your company a loan for the wages that you worked during that period of time. And so getting access to them whenever you want it makes a lot of sense. Um, so even came to the market with a, uh, there are benefit that they work with like uh, Walmart, for example, and they will uh, distribute their product to everybody within Walmart so that uh, people don't have to be ads uh, dependent on payday loans and predatory loans. Um, and they wanted, to figure out uh, as they were moving away, uh, moving, expanding beyond this just earned wage access into new products and services, what they should offer and how they should communicate it and what the experience should be like in the app. The thing that they wanted to offer was a savings product. Um, and they were having pretty low adoption of it. And we talked to some of their users and realized very quickly that the experience was that people would come in through the app, they would sign up for the EWA, and at the end, um, even would say, hey, do you want a savings account? Like it has all these great benefits. And like somewhere in the teens, people would adopt that. And so we very quickly realized that this was a, a, a default setting that was misaligned with their objectives. And so defaults, one of the big crown jewels of behavioral science, uh, if you are unfamiliar with uh, the Dutch uh, study of using defaults to increase organ donation, I highly recommend that you go and check that out. Uh, the, the, the Dutch government spent uh, millions of dollars trying to get people to become organ donors. Their neighbors, uh, Austria and Belgium and France, had really, really high donation rates, like almost 100%, while the UK and Germany and Denmark, some other neighbors, had really, really low uh, adoption rates. And they couldn't figure out what the deal was. They spent a bunch of money on marketing. It gave them a little bit of lift to, to above their competitor, you know, around similar nations, but not the, you know, almost 100% compliance that they wanted. Behavioral scientists came in, ran a study, basically showed that uh, it's whether you opt out or opt in to being an organ donor at what is effectively the DMV, the place where you go and get your vehicle set up. People are not having existential crises about whether they want to give their organs to uh, other people when they are trying to get out of the system, the government building that uh, uses 
that you use to register your car. Uh, and so what they do is they uh, take the default setting and agree with it, right? So in, in America and in the Netherlands, you had to opt in to being an organ donor, check the box. And in other countries, you had to opt out, check the box to be uh, to opt out. And so we thought this probably applies to even. So we built them uh, a new flow and had some folks user test it uh, where we defaulted people in to the savings account early on in the flow instead of getting through the whole thing and then asking them about it later. We also default the, defaulted them into an amount, $1, that was a KPI for one of their clients um, per paycheck. So uh, trying to get people to save $100 a year. Uh, not a whole lot, but considering that the average American can't spare a $400 expense, it's non-trivial. Um, so we put the uh, default in the savings of flow. We gave them a little bit of a social proof nudge here and a default in the amount. Uh, and we saw a three X, three and a half times uh, increase in the amount of people that signed up for the savings flow, our best condition, which prompted people to uh, then put in a smaller amount if they opted out, had 98% compliance, very much in line with our organ donation study there. On average, we got people to do about 70, uh, 73%. Um, increase in, in adoption of the savings flow, uh, sorry, so contributions to savings. Um, and the mode uh, was 1%, right? Uh, one, $1, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the most common answer was that people uh, contributed $1. Uh, this is a massive lift over the previous experience, which was getting about 10% of people to save. Okay, I am probably a little over my time here. Um, so here's a quick recap. People science is the study of how people really make decisions. Um, users are probably more like Homer than Spock. Um, use a mixed methodology approach because your, qu your qualitative uh, is not always uh, scalable uh, and you uh, want to validate the ideas that you've come up with, not just generate them. And uh, behavioral science principles we've learned today uh, are framing narr uh, narrative bias, social proof, loss aversion, relative choices, and the power of defaults. Uh, with that, uh, there are, so well, I'll turn it over. I don't know if we have time for questions. We've got a nice link to a bunch of resources that we love here if you want to learn more about payroll science. And cool, that's it, done. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, fantastic presentation there and great to see the interactivity from the audience as well. Um, hope you enjoyed presenting. I'm just going to get our um, presenters back on stage as well for our panel discussion now. We've had lots of questions coming through um, throughout the evening, so we'll be covering those. Some of those as well have touched on your presentation too. Um, so just welcome our presenters back on. So guys, if you'd like to turn your cameras and your mics, that would be super. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, how's everyone doing? Oh, good. Good. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for those fantastic presentations. So much content there and some really great takeaways. Um, as I just mentioned, we've had some questions coming through and um, also a lot of discussion within the general chat. Um, people are really busy in there, which is always a really nice indication that it's an area of interest to our community. So big thanks to the audience for being here this evening. Apologies, you've got a bit later than um, intended. Um, that sometimes happens. Um, but I'll now pass over to Helena, who's our host for this thank evening. You. Lovely to lovely to see you. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well indeed. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really good. Yes. Thank you. I'll let you give a bit of an intro um, and then sort of let you take the reins in regards to the discussion and the panel this tonight. Um, but big thanks again for organising this. Um, I know you put a huge amount of effort into aligning everyone in advance. So yeah, super excited okay. for a bit of a meaty discussion. Yeah, I hope so anyway, but um, thanks very much for that, Izzy, um, and uh, also the, the intro as well. Yep, my name's Helena Hill. I haven't been giving a presentation tonight, and it's actually been lovely because I do quite a lot of that. Um, and so it's been nice to be able to sit back and, and listen to my UX um, colleague and behavioral science colleagues, of course, um, uh, talking about what they do in theirs. But just a quick intro from me. I'm a freelance UX strategist. I'm based in Newcastle, uh, which is Northeast England. Um, I do tend to work with uh, from startups, SMEs, uh, right through to multinational organizations. Um, well, work ranges anything from auditing, building UX teams, um, 
and implementing uh, UX and data strategies. Uh, so I absolutely, I'm, I'm very lucky, uh, love my job. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm often asked to do things like this, which is, is hosting a panel. And uh, it's not often though, however, I do get to host a panel of people who do what I do. So it's uh, it, it's wonderful to have you all here. And, and first of all, I would like to thank you all for your um, your insightful and, and and just brilliant presentations this evening. Um, it, they are absolutely fantastic. And it, it's wonderful to hear you as advocates for, for UX strategy, um, uh, you know, spreading the word uh, amongst the UX um, and customer experience community. So, so first of all, very much thank you for that. I have been scribbling away. I'm not gonna show you my desk because I think it's covered in post-it notes, which of course, is the main staple, is it not, for anybody who works in UX. Um, the one mistake I did make was not color coding them because I'd run out. So everybody's got orange post-it notes. So I do apologize in advance if, uh, if I do cross questions in that way. But first of all, um, and thank you also to the to the, uh, the the audience tonight who have been listening. And there's been some amazing questions coming in, um, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to to cover some of those tonight. My aim is really is that this is more of a conversation. It's more of a fireside chat than it is a that you know than a, a, a sort of question and answer session. So I'm hoping, even though a question is aimed at a particular member of the panel. Um, I am sure that there will be some input from, from the others. Um, there seems to be several themes that have come out tonight, not surprisingly, um, around empathy, uh, for one, um, teams, um, specific, you know, particularly from Yuri's and Melanie's talk, um, UX maturity uh, is something that has also come up on, on several occasions, vision and outcomes, um, the ROI of UX, ah, that big question, I guess, that we often get asked. <laughs> what is the ROI of the work that you're doing? Yes. Um, somebody's actually questioned that as well, and I've jotted it down somewhere, so we'll get to that in a moment. Um, from Brad particularly, and this is something that I feel very strongly about, is creating those um, intelligent strategic insights from that data that we're collecting um, from our users and our stakeholders, um, and also framing the benefit as well um, to users and, and, and how we can go about doing that. Um, and I suppose what I want to do is, is kick off actually um, with UX maturity, if you don't mind, it, you but don't mind as a panel. Um, you know, we've, I guess most of the people on the call tonight, if you've been in UX some time, or even if you haven't, you may have come across Niels and Norman's uh, UX maturity scale. Um, and I guess I'd like to hear from the panel, um, you know, what is it that you think is the main driver in increasing UX maturity in, um, in organizations? I mean, what constitutes a UX mature organization? And does being more strategically, does just being more mature um, mean they're more strategic in their UX thinking? So there's just a few things to kick us off with there. Does anybody want to take that as a, a starter for 10? Dimitri, actually, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind starting off on that one, and then we'll pass it round a little bit. Okay, so you had three questions about UX maturity. Yes, I, I was a little bit cheeky. I, I fit three into one there. Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, the, if I remember uh, correctly, the first one is uh, what's the importance of UX maturity uh, for the, the company? What's the main driver? What do you think is the main driver of UX maturity? In uh, it is to get UX talent. Uh, like if you hire them, they will stay with your company. But that's not the, the first one. It's actually to get uh, the, the value of UX people in your organization because they will be able to spend their time doing the actual work and not fighting the fights that will enable them to do the work. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a really big pain point for a lot of people uh, working in UX. Um, shall I move on to the second question? You, you can if you like. No, I was just going to come back on that one just very, very slightly because when I've worked with organizations that have large UX teams in-house and I have worked with multinational organizations who have a UX person, um, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and that can be, that is obviously a huge challenge to UX maturity. And I'm just wondering if that's the case that there is almost a lack of understanding as to what actually the term UX means um, and what those, you know, uh, what those people are expected to do within that role. 
in, in my experience, uh, everybody thinks that they know what UX is and they judge by the, the tangibles, the artifacts that UX creates, right? Nobody understands what's beneath the hood, what's uh, under the sea. Like you see the ice, uh, the iceberg graph, right? Mm-hmm. There's a ton of decision making and stuff going on that people don't see then and they don't get. And they will uh, actually question a UXer saying we should be doing something like that, or yeah. discussing or proposing something, but they're not going to be do the, doing the same with uh, their hairdresser and their new or latest haircut. And that that amazes me. Yeah. But, uh, Will he big pain point in UX world? Yeah, and and I it, I want to come to something that Tugba said actually on that, and and that was I love this idea about empathising not only with our users and our customers, but also empathising with teams and mm-hmm. other departments with an organisation. Tugba, would you know? Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, um, it's about culture, I think. Yeah. Because yeah, people uh, will not know what to expect from UX just only because we teach them what to expect or how to uh, translate uh, those UX research results. Uh, they can't understand it uh, in the way that we look uh, for it because we have we learn these methodologies and we train our brains. Maybe I can say that. Uh, Brett, uh, apologies, but we train ourselves uh, to look in this way. Uh, we know so many disciplines and um, design thinking brings that idea of looking that uh, from a, a multi-angle way. So we don't, we can't expect uh, them to learn it at the first day on by talking with a UX designer or UX person. They have to feel the culture. They have to um, they have to grow in it. So for me, going back to your uh, first question, actually, UX research is essential. Yeah, you, how UX research is in an organization and how the UX re- research findings are translated. Uh, into actionable uh, actions mm-hmm. is critical. Uh, that's that's actually what UX strategy is at the end yeah. for me. Yeah. So um, we should be uh, aligned on the findings and what to do with them. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with you there. And I think it's all, um, you know, in my experience, it's certainly been a case of having to maybe not educate per se, but on a cross-departmental level, but also on a hierarchical level as well, um, you know, and get that that buy-in uh, per se from, from not only the executive, but also from the people working on it for, for sake of a better term, the shop floor. Um, it's so very, very important. Um, I'm going to just ask a question um, to maybe Brad and Yuri and, and Melanie here. Um, what would you say have been your biggest strategic challenges to date? would like to take that one first. <laughs> I, I'm happy to try to merge some of those things and try to maybe move that conversation forward. Yes, so please. as the only person who's like not a, a total, uh, tra- totally trained in the UX world, um, our one of our challenges has been finding organizations, uh, finding the right size of organization uh, in order to sort of slot in and, and help. Uh, because as you guys were pointing out, sometimes there's like one research yes. person for a giant multinational corporation and they're expected to understand UX, UI and qualitative research and quantitative research and data analysis and all the things. And you're just like, man, how can we support you? I don't, how can I be more empathetic to this like one person who is supposed to <laughs> juggle all these all these really interesting things. And then I think the other piece of that too is that as I collaborate with more and more um, UX and and UI folks, uh, I would really love to know at what point in the organization is this sort of thinking and and what, like, do you guys have a sense of at what point in a company's life do you go from no UX UI to consulting person to one person to a team? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, And when should you be thinking about making those decisions because behavioral scientists have sort of the same thing and we're allied in a lot of ways and i think that there's overlap but i'm curious to see 
what people, I mean, and obviously we should be the second hire for everybody, but like uh, <laughs> realistically would love to know what other people have sort of bumped into there. Uh, Yuri and Melanie, do you have any any insights on that? What's What's been your biggest strategic challenge? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question, but I would say that as an agency, we're always, uh, let's say, like working outside of an organization, right? We're, we're brought in to solve a problem that the organization itself can't solve. Mm -hmm. But we're because we are outside, we 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 can allow ourselves to think differently and and uh, like not not be bothered with you know the day to day struggles that an organization has. But that is also the the biggest strategic challenge, I would say, for us to actually make impact for that organization because we are outside of that organization it's really hard to get inside that organization and really change the i mean it's it's one thing to come up with amazing ideas and amazing prototypes and amazing design but it's another thing to actually launch something and maybe even change processes and culture within an organization uh maybe, maybe they're just not ready for the for the type of stuff that we we present and that's for me personally that's generally the biggest strategic challenge to yeah to actually make impact for an organization being outside of that organization yeah absolutely yeah, i think to that point that sometimes you know we suggest these things and an organization just isn't ready they might not have that ux or tech discipline so mm -hmm if we can embed in an organization and help over time, that's why so many companies are actually building in-house teams to do some of this work and to grow their UX maturity. And it comes down to a few different things. Like we can suggest, okay, as important as this idea is, you need to have the capability, you need to have the mindset and your organization probably has to be structured in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But we're also tied to the kind of how you engage an agency is in a dream world, you know, you have them on a retainer and you work on many projects and you're not, you know, being, you're not paying them per project, but that's not the reality. And we can't just sign into these SOWs or, or contracts that don't have an end deliverable. So you end up that people think UX or the results are just the artifacts that you're kind of checking off. So it's really difficult to engage an agency as a partner um, and, when that's the financial model, but also when you have to worry about, okay, what other clients are they working for or whatever, you know, there's this kind of, yeah, an ingrained challenge to that partnership. But if we could do that, then we could over time really help um, build out those capabilities as well as the, um, the sort of intangible things that you don't see under the hood. No. Um, True. And I think that brings us back to that ROI, isn't it? What it what is a an organization yeah. or a business yeah. seeing in return? It, you know, uh, sort of like you mentioned, under the hood, it's not always that tangible outcome, is it? And, and I guess that brings me on to quite an interesting question, actually, that came from Stam. Um, and I think actually it came actually during your your presentation, Yuri and Melanie. And it says, and, and it is a good question, this one, why are all UXs? which is, I think is all of us in the room, Brad, yourself included, you work with the UXs, but why are we so obsessed with proving ROI? We don't see other disciplines doing this. Do you really need to prove that you do what you are hired for? I don't know if it comes from UXers. I don't, I think it comes from and maybe this is a bit of a controversial idea, but you know, I think when you see tech disciplines, the output is extremely clear, right? Like you can see the length of code, you can see things being pushed live all the time. Whereas the UX, sometimes an insight can just be delivered through a conversation and that makes huge impact. So we've had to prove the ROI or show the value in order to get more funding to grow UX. I don't think that's really how we want to work or that we want to talk about ROI, but we have to in order to actually get more funding for bigger UX projects. Yeah. Um, but curious what others yeah, say. Yeah, I, I agree. It, you know, when I'm talking to, you know, you know, UXs or I, I'm work, I often find myself working with these one person UX departments. And it's quite difficult because 
sometimes I think the UX is generally, I'm not mentioning certainly any of us in the room, but find it quite difficult to talk about what ROI actually means to the organization that we're working with. And sometimes it is that it is that word, it's the M word. It's all about money. You know, why do we want to improve the user or customer experience of our products and services? Because we want to grow, we want to become more profitable. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with with um with referring to that as an ROI but I completely agree with you Melanie it's not for UX um, and I suppose to Stam I hope this answers your question it's not like coding where we are producing an artifact maybe Dimitri you want to come in on this I can see <laughs> yes yes please yes. in my humble opinion it's because nobody questions uh, the developers words uh, work or the QA's work or nobody else's it's just the UX because it seems easy to do. Nobody will say the developer, oh, you need two weeks for that. Mm -hmm. No, you have three days because then everything breaks down. And it's not that easy to see the actual impact of uh, UX work. And that's really, that's really, really important for us to, to make sure that we spend our time to do our work, first of all. Yeah. And this is why we need to do the ROI. Actually, it would be good to have the ROI for everybody mm -hmm. because by measuring, we know what we're doing, and if we do something wrong, then we can start uh, improving, right? We, we get a feedback loop there, and that's really, really important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, if, if yeah. I think there's a, yeah, I have a, a two prong thought there, if you don't mind. Just, uh, <laughs> I, I would a challenge the premise of the of the question here, right? To say that only UXers care about ROI, I think that's just flat wrong. Uh, I, maybe they're slightly yeah. more obsessed than other people. <laughs> But everybody cares about ROI. We live in a capitalist society and everyone's trying to turn a profit here. And so I can tell you that as a multidisciplinary agency, our developers care about ROI and our creatives care about ROI and our um, that, that's what drives conversations, right? That, that's the underlying motivation of corporations is ROI. And so everybody has to care about it to some level. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would even press back, back on the idea that developers don't have that same pressure burden. Developers do have that same pressure. If you have to turn around an app in a couple of days for a launch uh, in order to get the, into the app store in order to be a profitable company, like they have, they have to show their worth. They have to show their value. Um, so I, that's sort of one. I would say that I think maybe there's a, an interesting sort of unique culture about ROI in um, in UX that is something that I'm not privy to. But I would say. I think a lot of people care about ROI and it's our main selling point across a lot of different parts of our agency. Yeah. The second piece is to say, uh, it's the reason we use mixed mix methodology in our in our um, organization, right? Mm -hmm. I can show you the ROI when I run mm -hmm. an A-B test at the top of the funnel and then pull your insights into the rest of the, into the experience because I've already decreased your cost, by, cost per click by 40%. That has some ROI built into the experiment that clients really like. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can say, okay, and now we're gonna pull that into these other places. And we may not be able to measure it as perfectly as we did up here, but you know that it works up here. You're gonna see an impact down here and that can factor in the ROI. And then you can have a conversation about the magnitude of the ROI. And so I do sort of wanna point out to say, there are great ways to talk ROI if you're if you in UX and in experimentation and in research that can be really powerful to folks if you can demonstrate. It. Absolutely, thank you for that, Brad. I completely agree. Yuri, you wanted to come in on that one earlier as well. Yeah. So um, thanks. My build, I guess, would be that ROI is one of the metrics. It's maybe the most important metrics for some people high up the you know the the chain, but. I think if we, it's really important to prove value, but I think the value can be proven in different ways as well. For example, the metrics that UX or, you know, customer facing uh, disciplines uh, like to work with and work with often are things like uh, customer satisfaction or delight or uh, brand preference or uh, things that are a bit more, let's say soft, um, but are measurable. And everyone knows, in my experience at least, the, the companies that we work for, that those metrics also impact ROI positively. So mm -hmm. I, I would say you don't necessarily always need to tie everything that you do back to ROI, but you do need to tie it back to these other metrics that I just mentioned, yeah. which then will uh, positively impact ROI. It is important for us to 
work uh, against outcomes and not deliverables or artifacts you know like uh, i remember us making giant posters of journeys like that stuff we don't do anymore and and that's not to say that it's not good but we we realize that the focus the bias to to outcome is more effective and and we still get to do the same type of work um but it's yeah more clear and more visible to people who don't know what we do it's it's not important for us to sh show process it's important for us to show results Absolutely. but these results could be you know like, like i say so softer than uh, than roi we've got Sorry. one last question i'm going to just do now and we, we literally have two minutes so it's a couple of words per person so when you work with an organization and you who is your best friend who do you want to make friends with when you take on a new project? Who do you want on your on board? Who do you want on your side, Dimitri? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe the main stakeholder, that, uh, yes. the person that will uh, open the doors for me to be able to speak with uh, with users and, and test. Uh, interesting, yeah, that's right. Access to users, definitely. Tukba, who's, who do you want to be? I think uh, the person who, uh, can give me access both to the development team and to the management. Okay. If there's such a person. Yep. <laughs> Melanie and Yuri, what would you say? Who do you need to make friends with? Who do you need on your side? Oh, quite a few people, I guess, but <laughs> um, people who could open up doors and allow us to investigate and also pitch to the right people whether that be at the top or you know down to the bottom for understanding yeah the door openers and the investors i suppose oh thank you very much brad i'm going to ask you for a couple of words because it is oh bang on half past eight so yeah. couple of words from um, you. for me <laughs> it's it's either head of product or head of product marketing those are the people for me that allow me to run the experiments and do the design in the product or run them farther up the funnel because I need yeah. to be able to uh, actually have the sample size. So those two people have access to the product and to the people and those are the people that I need. Lovely. Thank you. And look at that. I kept it so brief. Thank you very much. Izzy, back to you because it is bang on 8.30. So that's there is the end of our panel. <laughs> it yes. is indeed. <laughs> that was as much as we could. <laughs> that was indeed. Thank you so much for facilitating the panel. And it was amazing. Pleasure. The questions you asked were just on the ball, definitely. Um, and really great for everyone to have an opportunity as well, because appreciate we were running on a bit with presentations and things, which does tend to happen. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for contributing this evening. Um, fantastic presentations, great discussions. I think we got through the majority of the questions. Um, but what we can do uh, for the audience's knowledge is we can actually have those questions answered, perhaps via LinkedIn or social channels as well. I'll have a log of those so I can recap on those tomorrow, just to make Make sure nothing was missed um but a big thank you to our sponsors again to our audience um and obviously to our panelists this evening and our panel host helena it was amazing um few things we have coming up i know i've touched upon them before but nft conference next week <laughs> it's uh coming up very soon and then business design towards the end of september as well um and if anyone in the audience is keen on speaking we have lots of opportunities still open for next year's events as well uh oh brad's hopped off hi brad oh he's gone <laughs> no worries <laughs> he did give me a i didn't know whether he was sort of <laughs> i don't know that was just an acknowledgement of something or whatever but anyway <laughs> Um, yeah, appreciate the time and everyone's got family commitments and things, but so, so big thank you to everyone. Um, looking forward to welcoming you back as well. Um, just to recap to our social channels, we also have um, Discord, which we've been using a lot recently for our community. Um, I'm just going to put a pop up for that as well. Um, it's a really great way to sort of interact with us and see what's going on, um, in particular for next week and for business and design. To our audience who weren't here at the beginning of the evening, the Business and Design Conference is coming up at the end of September and focusing on the maturity of the designer. So the frameworks, the business acumen, the knowledge and the confidence you need <laughs> um, as a designer in order to progress and get a seat at the table. Um, I've already had three um, members of our audience um, message me regarding the conference. So that's really fantastic. Um, that's what it's about this evening. Um, but yeah, thanks again, guys. Um, 
big thank you to also um, the team backstage, uh, my online team, marketing team, <laughs> community team, and also to Will for facilitating tonight. So yeah, look forward to welcoming you back and uh, touch base soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>